The Coral Island by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Nine. Prepare for a journey round the island. Sagacious reflections. Mysterious appearances and startling occurrences. Scarcely had the sun shot its first ray across the bosom of the broad Pacific when Jack sprang to his feet and hallooing in Peterkin's ear to awaken him, ran down the beach to take his customary dip in the sea. We did not, as was our wont, bathe that morning in our water garden, but in order to save time refreshed ourselves in the shallow water just opposite the bower. Our breakfast was also dispatched without loss of time, and in less than an hour afterwards all our preparations for the journey were completed. In addition to his ordinary dress, Jack tied a belt of coconut cloth round his waist, into which he thrust the axe. I was also advised to put on a belt and carry a short cudgel or bludgeon in it, for as Jack truly remarked, the sling would be of little use if we should chance to come to close quarters with any wild animal. As for Peterkin, notwithstanding that he carried such a long and, I must add, frightful-looking spear over his shoulder, we could not prevail on him to leave his club behind. For, he said, a spear at close quarters is not worth a button. I must say that it seemed to me that the club was, to use his own style of language, not worth a button hole, for it was all knotted over at the head, something like the club which I remembered to observe in picture books of Jack and the Giant Killer, besides being so heavy that he required to grasp it with both hands in order to wield it at all. However, he took it with him, and in this manner we set out upon our travels. We did not consider it necessary to carry any food with us, as we knew that wherever we went we would be certain to fall in with coconut trees, having which we were amply supplied, as Peterkin said, with meat and drink and pocket handkerchiefs. I took the precaution, however, to put the burning glass into my pocket, lest we should want fire. The morning was exceedingly lovely. It was one of that very still and peaceful sort, which made the few noises that we heard seem to be quiet noises. I know of no other way of expressing this idea. Noises which, so far from interrupting the universal tranquillity of earth, sea, and sky, rather tended to reveal to us how quiet the world round us really was. Such sounds as I referred to were the peculiar melancholy, yet it seemed to me cheerful, plaint of sea-birds floating on the glassy waters or sailing in the sky. Also the subdued twittering of little birds among the bushes, the faint ripples on the beach, and the solemn boom of the surf upon the distant coral reef. We felt very glad in our hearts as we walked along the sands, side by side. For my part, I felt so deeply overjoyed that I was surprised at my own sensations, and fell into a reverie upon the causes of happiness. I came to the conclusion that a state of profound peace and repose, both in regard to outward objects and within the soul, is the happiest condition in which man can be placed. For although I had many a time been most joyful and happy when engaged in bustling, energetic, active pursuits or amusements, I never found that such joy or satisfaction was so deep or so pleasant to reflect upon as that which I now experienced, and I was the more confirmed in this opinion when I observed, and indeed, as told by himself, that Peterkin's happiness was also very great. Yet he did not express this by dancing, as was his wont, nor did he give so much as a single shout, but walked quietly between us with his eye sparkling and a joyful smile upon his countenance. My reader must not suppose that I have thought all this in the clear and methodical manner in which I set it down here. These thoughts did indeed pass through my mind, but they did so in a very confused and indefinite manner, for I was young at the time, and not much given to deep reflections. Neither did I consider that the peace whereof I write is not to be found in this world, at least in its perfection, although I have since learned that, by religion, a man may attain to a very great degree of it. I have said that Peterkin walked along the sands between us. We had 
two ways of walking together about our island. When we traveled through the woods we always did so in single file, as by this method we advanced with greater facility, the one treading in the other's footsteps. In such cases Jack always took the lead, Peterkin followed, and I brought up the rear. But when we traveled along the sands, which extended almost in an unbroken line of glistening white round the island, we marched abreast, as we found this method more sociable and every way more pleasant. Jack, being the tallest, walked next to the sea, and Peterkin marched between us, as by this arrangement either of us could talk to him or he to us, while if Jack and I happened to wish to converse we could conveniently do so over Peterkin's head. Peterkin used to say, in reference to this arrangement, that had he been as tall as either of us our order of march might have been the same, for as Jack often used to scold him for as Jack often used to scold him for letting everything we said to him pass in at one ear and out at the other. His head could, of course, form no interruption to our discourse. We were now fairly started. Half a mile's walk conveyed us round a bend in the land which shut out our bower from view, and for some time we advanced at a brisk pace without speaking, though our eyes were not idle, but noted everything, in the woods, on the shore, or in the sea, that was interesting. And passing the ridge of land that formed one side of our valley, the valley of the wreck, we beheld another small vale lying before us in all the luxuriant loveliness of tropical vegetation. We had indeed seen it before from the mountain top, but we had no idea that it would turn out to be so much more lovely when we were close to it. We were about to commence the exploration of this valley when Peterkin stopped us, and directed our attention to a very remarkable appearance in advance along the shore. "'What's yon, think you?' said he, leveling his spear as if he expected an immediate attack from the object in question, though it was full half a mile distant. As he spoke there appeared a white column above the rocks, as if of steam or spray. It rose upwards to a height of several feet, and then disappeared. Had this been near the sea we would not have been so greatly surprised, as it might in that case have been the surf for at this part of the coast the coral reef approached so near to the island that in some parts it almost joined it. There was, therefore, no lagoon between, and the heavy surf of the ocean beat almost up to the rocks. But this white column appeared about fifty yards inland. The rocks at the place were rugged, and they stretched across the sandy beach into the sea. Scarce had we ceased expressing our surprise at this sight, when another column flew upwards for a few seconds, not far from the spot where the first had been seen, and disappeared. And so, at long, irregular intervals, these strange sights recurred. We were now quite sure that the columns were watery, or composed of spray, but what caused them we could not guess, so we determined to go and see. In a few minutes we gained the spot, which was very rugged, and precipitous, and moreover quite damp with the falling of the spray. We had much ado to pass over dry shod. The ground also was full of holes here and there. Now, while we stood anxiously waiting for the reappearance of these waterspouts, we heard a low rumbling sound near us, which quickly increased to a gurgling and hissing sound, and a moment afterwards a thick spout of water burst upwards from a hole in the rock and spouted into the air with much violence, and so close to where Jack and I were standing that it nearly touched us. We sprang aside, but not before a cloud of spray descended and drenched us both to the skin. Peterkin, who was standing farther off, escaped with a few drops, and burst into an uncontrollable fit of laughter on beholding our miserable plight. "'Mind your eye!' he shouted eagerly. "'There goes another!' The words were scarcely out of his mouth when there came up a spout from another hole, which served us exactly in the same manner as before. Peterkin now shrieked with laughter, but his merriment was abruptly put to a stop by the gurgling noise occurring close to where he stood. 
where it'll spout this time, I wonder, he said, looking about with some anxiety and preparing to run. Suddenly there came a loud hiss or snort. A fierce spout of water burst up between Peterkin's legs, blew him off his feet, enveloped him in its spray, and hurled him to the ground. He fell with so much violence that we feared he must have broken some of his bones and ran anxiously to his assistance. But fortunately he had fallen on a clump of tangled herbage, in which he lay sprawling in a most deplorable condition. It was now our turn to laugh, but as we were not quite yet sure that he was unhurt, and as we knew not when or where the next spout might arise, we assisted him hastily to jump up and hurry from the spot. I may here add that, although I am quite certain that the spout of water was very strong, and that it blew Peterkin completely off his legs, I am not quite certain of the exact height to which it lifted him, being somewhat startled by the event, and blinded partially by the spray, so that my power of observation was somewhat impaired for the moment. "'What's to be done now?' asked Peterkin ruefully. "'Make a fire, lad, and dry ourselves,' replied Jack. "'And here is material ready to our hand,' said I, picking up a dried branch of tree as we hurried up to the woods. In about an hour after this mishap our clothes were again dried. While they were hanging up before the fire we walked down to the beach and soon observed that these curious spouts took place immediately after the fall of a huge wave, never before it, and moreover that the spouts did not take place excepting when the billow was an extremely large one. From this we concluded that there must be a subterraneous channel in the rock, into which the water was driven by the larger waves, and finding no way of escape except through these small holes, was thus forced up violently through them. At any rate, we could not conceive any other reason for these strange water spouts, and as this seemed a very simple and probable one, we forthwith adopted it. I say, Ralph, what's that in the water? Is it a shark? said Jack, just as we were about to quit the place. I immediately ran to the overhanging ledge of rock, from which he was looking down into the sea and bent over it. Then I saw a very faint, pale object of greenish color, which seemed to move slightly while I looked at it. "'It's like a fish of some sort,' said I. "'Hallo, Peterkin!' cried Jack. Fetch your spear, here's work for it. But when we tried to reach the object, the spear proved to be too short. There now, said Peterkin with a sneer, you were always telling me it was too long. Jack now drove the spear forcibly towards the object and let go his hold, but although it seemed to be well aimed, he must have missed, for the handle soon rose again, and when the spear was drawn up, there was the pale green object in exactly the same spot, slowly moving its tail. Very odd, said Jack, but although it was undoubtedly very odd, and although Jack and all of us plunged the spear at it repeatedly, we could neither hit it nor drive it away, so we were compelled to continue our journey without discovering what it was. I was very much perplexed at this strange appearance in the water and could not get it out of my mind for a long time afterwards. However, I quieted myself by resolving that I would pay a visit to it again at some more convenient season. End of chapter 9 Recording by Tom Weiss The Coral Island by R. M. Ballantyne Chapter 10 make discovery of many excellent roots and fruits, the resources of the coral island gradually unfolded, the banyan tree, another tree which is supported by natural planks, waterfowl found, a very remarkable discovery, and a very peculiar murder. We luxuriate on the fat of the land. Our examination of the little valley proved to be altogether most satisfactory. We found in it not only similar trees to those we had already seen in our own valley, but also one or two others of a different species. We had also the satisfaction of discovering a peculiar vegetable, which, Jack concluded, 
must certainly be that of which he had read as being very common among the South Sea Islanders, and which was named taro. Also we found a large supply of yams, and another root like a potato in appearance. As these were all quite new to us, we regarded our lot as a most fortunate one in being thus cast on an island which was so prolific and so well stored with all the necessaries of life. Long afterwards we found out that this island of ours was no better in these respects than thousands of other islands in those seas. Indeed, many of them were much richer and more productive, but that did not render us the less grateful for our present good fortune. We each put one of these roots in our pocket, intending to use them for our supper, of which more hereafter. We also saw many beautiful birds here, and traces of some four-footed animal again. Meanwhile the sun began to descend, so we returned to the shore and pushed on, round the spouting rocks, into the next valley. This was that valley of which I have spoken as running across the entire island. It was by far the largest and most beautiful that we had yet looked upon. Here were trees of every shape and size and hue which it is possible to conceive of, many of which we had not seen in the other valleys, for the stream in this valley being larger and the mold much richer than in the valley of the wreck, it was clothed with a more luxuriant growth of trees and plants. Some trees were dark, glossy green, others of a rich and warm hue, contrasting well with those of a pale, light green, which were everywhere abundant. Among these we recognized the broad, dark heads of the breadfruit, with its golden fruit, the pure, silvery foliage of the candle-nut, and several species which bore a strong resemblance to the pine, while here and there, in groups and in single trees, rose the tall forms of the coconut palms, spreading abroad and waving their graceful plumes high above all the rest, as if they were a superior race of stately giants keeping guard over these luxuriant forests. Oh, it was a most enchanting scene, and I thanked God for having created such delightful spots for the use of man. Now, while we were gazing around us in silent admiration, Jack uttered an exclamation of surprise, and pointing to an object a little to one side of us said, That's a banyan tree. And what's a banyan tree? inquired Peterkin as we walked towards it. A very curious one, as you shall see presently, replied Jack. It is called the Aoa here, if I recollect rightly, and has a wonderful peculiarity about it. What an enormous one it is, to be sure. It, replied Peterkin, why, there are dozens of banyans here. What do you mean by talking bad grammar? Is your philosophy deserting you, Jack? There is but one tree here of this kind, returned Jack as you will perceive if you will examine it. And sure enough, we did find that what we had supposed was a forest of trees was, in reality, only one. Its bark was of a light color and had a shining appearance, the leaves being lance-shaped, small, and of a beautiful pea-green. But the wonderful thing about it was that the branches, which grew out from the stem horizontally, sent down long shoots or fibers to the ground which, taking root, had themselves become trees and were covered with bark like the tree itself. Many of these fibers had descended from the branches at various distances, and thus supported them on natural pillars, some of which were so large and strong that it was not easy at first to distinguish the offspring from the parent stem. The fibers were of all sizes and in all states of advancement, from the pillars we have just mentioned to small cords which hung down and were about to take root, and thin brown threads still far from the ground, which swayed about with every motion of wind. In short, it seemed to us that, if there were only space afforded to it, this single tree would at length cover the whole island. Shortly after this we came upon another remarkable tree, which, as its peculiar formation afterwards proved extremely useful to us, merit's description. It was a splendid chestnut, but its proper name Jack did not know. However, there were quantities of fine nuts upon it, some of which we put in our pockets. But its stem was the most wonderful part of it. It rose to about twelve feet without a branch, 
and was not of great thickness. On the contrary, it was remarkably slender for the size of the tree. But to make up for this, there were four or five wonderful projections in this stem, which I cannot better describe than by asking the reader to suppose that five planks of two inches thick and three feet broad had been placed round the trunk of the tree, with their edges closely fixed to it, from the ground up to the branches, and that these planks had been covered over with the bark of the tree and incorporated with it. In short, they were just natural buttresses, without which the stem could not have supported its heavy and umbracious top. We found these chestnuts to be very numerous. They grew chiefly on the banks of the stream, and were of all sizes. While we were examining a small tree of this kind, Jack chipped a piece off a buttress with his axe, and found the wood to be firm and easily cut. He then struck the axe into it with all his force, and very soon split it off close to the tree, first, however, having cut it across transversely above and below. By this means he satisfied himself that we could now obtain short planks, as it were already sawn, of any size and thickness that we desired, which was a very great discovery indeed, perhaps the most important we had yet made. We now wended our way back to the coast, intending to encamp near the beach, as we found that the mosquitoes were troublesome in the forest. On our way we could not help admiring the birds which flew and chirped around us. Among them we observed a pretty kind of paroquet, with a green body, a blue head, and a red breast. Also a few beautiful turtle-doves, and several flocks of wood-pigeons. The hues of many of these birds were extremely vivid, bright green, blue, and scarlet being the prevailing tints. We made several attempts throughout the day to bring down one of these, both with the bow and the sling, not for mere sport, but to a certain whether they were good for food. But we invariably missed, although once or twice we were very near hitting. As evening drew on, however, a flock of pigeons flew past. I slung a stone into the midst of them at a venture, and had the good fortune to kill one. We were startled soon after by a loud whistling noise above our heads, and on looking up saw a flock of wild ducks making for the coast. We watched these, and observing where they alighted, followed them until we came upon a most lovely blue lake, not more than two hundred yards long, embosomed in verdant trees. Its placid surface which reflected every leaf and stem as if in a mirror, was covered with various species of wild ducks, feeding among the sedges and broad-leaved water-plants which floated on it, while numerous birds like water-hens ran to and fro most busily on its margin. These all, with one accord, flew tumultuously away the instant we made our appearance. While walking along the margin we observed fish in the water, but of what sort we could not tell. Now, as we neared the shore, Jack and I said we could go a little out of our way to see if we could procure one of those ducks. So, directing Peterkin to go straight to the shore and kindle a fire, we separated, promising to rejoin him speedily. But we did not find the ducks, although we made a diligent search for half an hour. We were about to retrace our steps, when we were arrested by one of the strangest sights that we had yet beheld. Just in front of us, at the distance of about ten yards, grew a superb tree, which certainly was the largest we had seen on the island. Its trunk was at least five feet in diameter, with a smooth gray bark. Above this the spreading branches were clothed with light green leaves, amid which were clusters of bright yellow fruit so numerous as to weigh down the bows with their great weight. This fruit seemed to be of the plum species, of an oblong form, and a good deal larger than the magnum bonum plum. The ground at the foot of this tree was thickly strewn with the fallen fruit, in the midst of which lay sleeping, in every possible attitude, at least twenty hogs of all ages and sizes, apparently quite surfeited with a recent banquet. 
Jack and I could scarce restrain our laughter as we gazed at these coarse, fat, ill-looking animals while they lay groaning and snoring heavily amid the remains of their supper. "'Now, Ralph,' said Jack in a low whisper, "'put a stone in your sling, a good big one, and let fly at that fat fellow with his back toward you. I'll try to put an arrow into yon little pig.' "'Don't you think we had better put them up first? I whispered. "'It seems cruel to kill them while asleep.' "'If I wanted sport, Ralph, I would certainly set them up. But as we only want pork, we'll let them lie. Besides, we're not sure of killing them, so fire away.' Thus admonished, I slung my stone with so good aim that it went bang against the hog's flank, as if against the head of a drum but it had no other effect than that of causing the animal to start to its feet with a frightful yell of surprise and scamper away. At the same instant Jack's bow twanged, and the arrow pinned the little pig to the ground by the ear. "'I've missed after all!' cried Jack, darting forward with uplifted axe, while the little pig uttered a loud squeal, tore the arrow from the ground, and ran away with it, along with the whole drove into the bushes and disappeared, though we heard them screaming long afterwards in the distance. "'That's very provoking now,' said Jack, rubbing the point of his nose. "'Very,' I replied, stroking my chin. "'Well, we must make haste and rejoin Peterkin,' said Jack. "'It's getting late.' And without further remark we threaded our way quickly through the woods towards the shore. When we reached it we found wood laid out, the fire lighted, and beginning to kindle up, with other signs of preparation for our encampment. But Peterkin was nowhere to be found. We wondered very much at this, but Jack suggested that he might have gone to fetch water, so he gave a shout to let him know that we had arrived, and sat down upon a rock, while I threw off my jacket and seized the axe, intending to split up one or two billets of wood. But I had scarce moved from the spot when, in the distance, we heard a most appalling shriek, which was followed up by a chorus of yells from the hogs and a loud hurrah. "'I do believe,' said I, "'that Peterkin has met with the hogs.' "'When Greek meets Greek,' said Jack, soliloquizing. "'Then comes the tug of hurrah!' shouted Peterkin in the distance. We turned hastily towards the direction whence the sound came and soon descried Peterkin walking along the beach towards us with a little pig transfixed on the end of his long spear. "'Well done, my boy!' exclaimed Jack, slapping him on the shoulder when he came up. "'You're the best shot amongst us!' "'Look here, Jack!' cried Peterkin as he disengaged the animal from his spear. "'Do you recognize that hole?' said he, pointing to the pig's ear. "'And are you familiar with this arrow, eh?' "'Well, I declare,' said Jack. "'Of course you do,' interrupted Peterkin. But pray restrain your declarations at this time, and let's have supper, for I'm uncommonly hungry, I can tell you, and it's no joke to charge a whole herd of swine with their great-grandmother, bristling like a giant porcupine at the head of them. We now set about preparing supper, and truly a good display of viands we made when all was laid out on a flat rock in the light of the blazing fire. There was, first of all, the little pig. Then there were the taro root, and the yam, and the potato, and six plums, and lastly the wood pigeon. To these Peterkin added a bit of sugar cane, which he had cut from a little patch of that plant which he had found not long after separating from us. And, said he, the patch was somewhat in a square form, which convinces me it must have been planted by man. Very likely, replied Jack. From all we have seen I'm inclined to think that some of the savages must have dwelt here long ago. We found no small difficulty in making up our minds how we were to cook the pig. None of us had ever cut one up before, and we did not know exactly how to begin. Besides, we had nothing but the axe to do it with, our knife having been forgotten. At last Jack started up and said, don't let us waste more time talking about it, boys. Hold it up, Peterkin. There, lay the hind leg on this block of wood so, and he cut it off. 
with a large portion of the haunch at a single blow of the axe. Now the other, that's it. And having thus cut off the two hind legs, he made several deep gashes in them, thrust a sharp-pointed stick through each, and stuck them up before the blaze to roast. The wood pigeon was then slid open, quite flat, washed clean in salt water, and treated in a similar manner. While these were cooking we scraped a hole in the sand and ashes under the fire, into which we put our vegetables and covered them up. The taro root was of an oval shape, about ten inches long and four or five thick. It was of a mottled gray color and had a thick rind. We found it somewhat like an Irish potato and exceedingly good. The yam was roundish and had a rough brown skin. It was very sweet and well flavored. The potato, we were surprised to find, was quite sweet and exceedingly palatable, as also were the plums, and indeed the pork and pigeon too, when we came to taste them. Altogether this was decidedly the most luxurious supper we had enjoyed for many a day. Jack said it was out of sight better than we ever got on board ship, and Peterkin said he feared that if we should remain long on the island we would infallibly become a glutton or an epicure, whereat Jack remarked that he need not fear that, for he was both already. And so, having eaten our fill, not forgetting to finish off with a plum, we laid ourselves comfortably down to sleep upon a couch of branches under the overhanging ledge of a coral rock. End of chapter 10 Recording by Tom Weiss